In this episode, I speak with Laura Khalil. Key points addressed were Laura's business and podcast, both called Brave by Design, and how she used the core tenets of her public speaking and coaching advice platforms to influence her podcast narrative. We also discussed Laura's expertise in podcast hosting and how she leveraged her skills based out of her former career in content marketing to become one of the top 100 Apple podcasts on the market. Stay tuned for my exciting talk with Laura Khalil. Hi, my name is Patricia Kathleen, and this podcast series will contain interviews I conduct with women, female-identified, and non-binary individuals regarding their professional stories and personal narrative as it relates to their perspective. This podcast is designed to hold a space for all individuals to learn from their counterparts, regardless of age, status, or industry. We intend to transparently investigate the evolving global dialogue regarding underrepresented figures in all industries across the USA and abroad. By hosting these stories and conversations, we aim to contribute to the changing platform and representation of these individuals for the future. Now let's start the conversation. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. I am your host, Patricia, and today I'm excited to be sitting down with Laura Khalil. Laura is a speaker, teacher, and podcast host of the podcast titled Brave by Design. You can find out more regarding everything we speak about today, as well as Laura herself, on her website, www.bravebydesign.net. Welcome, Laura. Patricia, thank you so much for having me here. It is so fun for me to speak with fellow podcasters, especially women in the field. I'm really excited for our discussion today. I am too. I cannot wait to unpack it. Um, we were talking off the air and I, I can't wait to kind of get into it. I do uh, appreciate and kind of overly enjoy talking to other podcasters too. And I know that a lot of our audience actually enjoys hearing about it. Launching your own podcast has been like one of the top 20 things um, at, by Newsweek. It announced that every new business founder is doing. So we're kind Whoa! of- trend, <laughs> right? I'm excited to unpack yours too. It's always a little bit different. I always tell everyone it's the wild west. You know, there's still a lot of ground that it you is. live with and things like that. So for those of you that are new to this podcast, I will first um, read a bio on Laura before I ask her to kind of develop more of that professional and personal story leading up to launching Brave by Design. And then we'll uh, go straight into actually unpacking you know, the podcast. We'll get into the logistics for those of you who are kind of interested in that end of it, when it was founded, if was there any funding, any co-founders, all of those types of things, how it was built. And then we'll get into the philosophy and the ethos of it behind how the curation is made and things of that nature. Um, then we'll look at goals and plans that Laura has for herself and the podcast and other business endeavors um, regarding all of that for the next one to three years. And we'll wrap the entire podcast up by talking about advice that Laura may have for those of you who are looking to get involved with her or perhaps emulate some of her career success. So as promised, before I start peppering her with questions, a quick bio, Laura Khalil is a speaker, teacher, and host of the top 100 Apple podcasts, Brave by Design, focused on helping women achieve incredible success in their careers and lives. She is a master storyteller consulting with clients such as Twitter, GE, and Intel on how to use storytelling to improve their lives of the, the lives of their customers. Laura's training unlocks the code to becoming magnetic to help ambi ambitious women learn how to rise, lead with empathy, and live abundantly. So Laura, I love that. And before we get into a kind of unpacking Brave by Design, which I think is very um, apropos for the, the podcast in which it's um, nestled with, I'm hoping mm. you describe your professional and personal history that led you to launching it. Absolutely. You know, when I first started my career, which was hard to, it's hard to believe it was 20 years ago, but it was, uh, there was no such thing as podcasting. It's certainly not that I was aware of. And I started my career in marketing. I was a content marketer by trade and I really broke into the tech world in Silicon Valley. That was part of the start of my career. And one of the things that kept happening to me as a full-time employee is I kept being told that I was just a little bit too much. I was told I was intimidating men, that I needed to soften my language, that I needed to smile more, that I needed to be more accommodating. In the meantime, my work was always getting high marks, but my personality was the problem. And 
I realize that I can't change my personality. I can't become someone different. That's not going to happen. So instead of repeating these situations that did not work for me, I had to change my circumstances. So in 2013, I launched my first business and that was doing what I knew, which was uh, doing content marketing as a consultant. And what I realized very quickly in running that business is within the first six weeks, I got my first major client that was Intel. Then I got GE, then I got Twitter, then I got into it and the ball was really kind of rolling from that point forward. And I realized that all of the trades that had penalized me as a full-time employee in a very toxic environment were my greatest assets as a leader and entrepreneur. And as I ran this business very successfully, where never again was I told I was too much, I was too direct. I was told, hey, we so value your advice. We're so glad you're here. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us. I realized that I wanted to use my voice to help empower other women in male dominated industries to build your influence and power. And so I began to speak. And about two years ago, I completely shifted my business again. I started my second company, which is Brave by Design, which is focused on speaking, which is focused on the podcast, and it's focused on training to help ambitious women live well and lead well. Absolutely. This is an area that's done, I think, um, and, and a lot of people have reached into it, but it's, I find that um, by no fault of anyone's in particular, you know, people who reach into um, anything from motivational speaking to empowerment speaking or, you know, on these corporate circuits, it can become kind of muddled, their message or their design, even though I find all of them, you know, that I've listened to um, via proxy or, you know, on this series, valid and with wonderful messages, it seems very unclear as to what their message is meant to do or what um, target audience they have. And yours is uniquely different from that. I feel very clarified, you know, um, having- Good, Patricia. Thank God. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) The difference is is stark, you know, between your message and what you're doing and um, and your intention. And so I think that, that that clarity comes across from, you know, your previous career in, you know, this kind of marketing and, and area of it. Yeah. Message is very, very clear and concise. And I find that, I mean, they tell all entrepreneurs that any little, you know, thing that I'm covering, like, you got to clarify that elevator pitch. You know, you got to get that, that pitch deck really clear. Like, what is your sell? What's your ask? Like, all of those things. And I think it's still kind of lost, particularly when it comes to even coaches. I've spoken to a lot of life coaches, career coaches, and um, I can't quite figure out who their target um, client is. I don't know what they specialize in. You know, there's a lot of terms that aren't clarified for me. Uh huh. Um, it's difficult to understand whether or not I would ever need to work with them or who they could possibly work with most beautifully. I kind Patricia, of- can I talk about that for just one second? Please. Because I think what part of the reason I was so successful in my first business as a marketing consultant and part of the reason I'm successful today is because I was very clear on who my audience is. And when I work with people, certainly who are struggling, let's say they're trying to start a business and they come to me because they've seen I've done a few things and they want to, they want help. And I say, who do you serve? Who's your market? And they'll say, well, I'm a writer. And I'm like, well, what the heck does that mean? You could be writing for the newspaper. You could be writing obituaries. You could be writing for tech. You could be writing for Panera. I don't know who, what are you talking about here? And so getting very clear on who you serve and how you serve them is real and being consistent is the key to success. When I started my first business, I was working with technical teams on technical marketing initiatives. Now that's incredibly specific. You know, but uh, I knew exactly who my market was, and that's why I was successful because they saw me and they said, "We need her. Let's go for it." Yeah, absolutely. And that clarity, I think it can't be said enough. You know, even when people think that they are very clear. Um, in, in since COVID, you know, I've had a lot of really um, not dear and distant and dear colleagues reach out who are redefining their businesses. People have had this, you know, chance to have a, another conversation or to revisit aspects of their business that aren't working fluidly. And um, there's been a lot of people that revamp themselves, but in that, I still find a lot of disclarity, you know, with the announcement emails yeah. like that I'm like, I don't get the change. What's happening? <laughs> like, what happened there? You- right. Because what's in it for you at the end of the day, 
the client needs to understand what is the outcome that you can help me achieve. Now, in any coaching process, in any speaking process, whatever it may be, we're co-creating an experience together. So if anyone's listening to this expecting a coach to fix you, that you're one half of the equation. You know, you both have to do the work together. And being able to speak to your clients, who I don't care who they are, if you're a coach, if you're a consultant, if you are in a full-time position, being able to speak to people in what they value, in what is important to them, is really going to help define you and help you uh, set yourself apart from the pack. Now, a lot of people are scared because they say, well, I do so many things. Listen, guys, I do so many things too. I mean, you should see me in my free time right now. I've got all kinds of side projects I'm working on. But the thing that I have, you have to focus on is what do I like doing that other people value that will also help me make money? Okay. At the end of the day, if we don't have money, we can't use that to be of service to the world. So money is not good or bad. It's just a tool of exchange to help us be of service to others. And uh, the greatest gift that you have and I have is to be able to do things we like, uh, become abundant in those areas, and then give back in the areas that are most important to us. Yeah, absolutely. I think becoming crystallized about what you like to do and then turning around and asking how you can utilize that to make you um, money is the key to like um, uh, success within oneself as well. The work-life oh, balance, totally. all of those conversations can go by the wayside once one is really fulfilled by their work. You know, it's one of the things that it's generational. I feel like there wasn't a lot of conversation. I'm older, I'm 43, but it was, there wasn't a lot of, when I was coming up, people were like, be a doctor, be a doctor or a lawyer. Like that's what you need to do or an accountant, something stable, you know, that will bring in income. And I think my children's generation is more about like, well, I'm creative. So I'd like to be in this space. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing. You're going to be such a happy adult, you know, <laughs> reconversation. I think there's ways of kind of slightly molding it as well and getting into areas that you're, you're talented with, and therefore it brings you, you know, people always say, well, you know, I don't know what will bring me happiness. And I'm like, whatever you're good at, this, this is like a yeah. disconnect with adults, you know, whatever you do fluidly. And it, that tends to bring us happiness. At least exactly. I mean, you know, Patricia, I love decorating cookies, but I'm going to tell you what, no one's going to buy my cookies. Okay. <laughs> they are a hot mess and that's okay. Cause they're for me. You know, that's, that's, people talk a lot about finding your passion. I'm not, and that's, you know, if you want to go down that route, go down that route. I'm more, find your sustainable interest. What do you want to do for the next 10 years? What do you want to really dig into that's sustainable that other people need from you? And um, run, try it. Run, the, the worst thing that can happen is it doesn't work. Yeah. That's it. I agree. So I want to turn to Unpacking Brave by Design now. And for all of our little um, nerdy startup founders and everyone else who's looking into starting it, um, I want to get into your logistics. When was uh, the podcast launched? Um, what was the impetus to the, for the launch? Did you take any funding um, to help you start it up? There's technical, there's people always say, I thought pot starting a podcast would be free. And I was like, oh, sweetie, no. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of time that you can consider free off your own back, but you know, the right. There's other, there's tech, there's software. If you don't have the knowledge as to editing, there's a whole bunch of stuff behind it. And I won't bore everyone with, there's a beautiful YouTubes and things of that nature and articles written to it. But for you personally, when was it started? What was the impetus for the launch? I mean, you got into it a little bit when you talked about kind of the end of, of the second part of um, marketing. And then did you take any funding or co-founders when you went into launching this endeavor? So yeah, let me, let me, I'd love to dig into that. So I started my speaking business uh, at the end of 2018. It took me about a year to really decide to start Brave by Design. So Brave by Design was launched in January of 2020. Uh, it, I did not take funding. I, when I started my career in tech, I worked for a lot of bootstrapped companies and I kind of, at a young age, you know, for better or for worse, you can do whatever you want, guys. But I developed an ethos around bootstrapping my ideas. And so I said, hey, we're gonna bootstrap this. And as a content marketer, as someone who comes from that domain, I wanted a vehicle to share my voice because I'm a speaker. I wanted to share my voice. I wanted to share my words. I wanted to bring credibility to what I do. 
And I wanted to begin to gain a following because as anyone who's listening knows, the best way to work is when you're working by referral. And I don't have to push people into working with me. I don't have to fill out uh, tons of RFPs and proposals and they sit in the stack and you're just like sitting at, you know, next to your bed at night, praying to God, somebody uh, contacts you. I like working by referral. And so when people listen to my show or people hear me on your show or other shows, they say, gosh, darn it. I like that woman. I want to learn more about her. And so then they get into the website and they get into um, that whole system, which then makes it easier to say yes when you're ready to buy. So that is sort of the business decision behind Brave by Design. Of course, everything that we do in our highest values, and obviously the podcast is a very high value to me, is always in service to others. So doing the podcast, you're not ever going to hear a sales pitch. You're never going to hear me trying to shove anything down your throat. That's, that's terrible. That's terrible marketing friends. Uh, instead, what you're going to hear from is two episodes every week. One episode is about mindset. And the second episode is where we bring on experts in business, in leadership, in psychology to help share their insights with you. I mean, I, goodness knows, I don't know everything. And so I love to bring on people who are a lot smarter than me to help teach our audience. And uh, it has been a complete joy. So Patricia, I don't know if I answered every question you had there, but uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. I want to follow that train of thought. You, you dropped a couple of breadcrumbs there. Um, we got into how it's curated and I like that. I think it's um, really genius. Um, I, I think that you, there's a free form format. Um, you know, it's the wild west out there as to how you can develop podcasts. There's no rhyme or reason. The length is often really um, actually even attractive to people in mainstream media because there's not this hard cut at 30 that you have to fill right. the past, things like that. But um, it's also the same for content. And it's cool that you've actually, as I said, you know, earlier with your clarity, you have a lot of clarity in designing this. And that's what I recommend a lot of people for starting a podcast is, get an idea. Are you bringing guests on? Are you bringing them on periodically? Why are right. you doing that? Are you bringing them on juxtapositioning? And so you having this kind of call and answer where, you know, you're giving your expertise and then bringing those on with other expertise to exemplify things you've said, or even talk about their own narrative is, um, is really clever. I want to get into another piece. Wait, Patricia, can I just add one? Can I inject one thing in there? Because this is really important for people to hear, and it's sort of like the underbelly of podcasting. You've probably experienced this as well. A lot of us think, oh, I'm going to bring on a big name, and they're going to help boost my numbers. <laughs> they're going to share it with their audience. They're going to help me. And that's what I thought, too. I thought, I'm going to bring on the biggest and the best and the brightest, and they're going to help lift this. And here's the truth, friends. That is really a crapshoot. Yeah. Some people, you know, that some people will promote. Other people will never acknowledge that it happened. And that's not because it's a bad episode. It's because they have a lot of competing interests. It's because they maybe just want to promote their, their appearance on MSNBC and your, your small, small peanuts next to that, right? You know, that's, you have to remember that. So I do say to people, when you're thinking about bringing guests on, Bring on guests who have a following, who are engaged. They don't have to be the top of their field. They don't have to be, you know, the people you see on the Today Show necessarily, but they, they have, you have a sense that they will help you promote the show because it's not always the celebs who will help. Do you, is that what you find? Oh, yeah. Always. And I, I, I started the game off very differently. My first podcast, this one actually, um, was about a philanthropic effort to help women share their, and female identified non-binary individuals share their professional chronicles. And mm -hmm. since then I've launched three others that have very different intentions. Um, not in that it's always about education, transparency, and sharing information. But this one in particular, for the first year, that really wasn't even my focus. So I was bringing people on. I also tell people, you know, I have, I've, I've had about better part of 30 years of experience of, you know, public speaking and, um, and, and performing and things of that nature my entire life. And podcasting was an, just a new beast. 
and bringing people on in the beginning, you know, for a few episodes, if you're not comfortable or you don't exactly have your voice or your brand or whatever you're calling it, um, you know, that may or may not have an audience or whatever else is a really good idea to kind of sharpen your wit, get your yeah. down, um, get your flow going. But I do find, oh yeah, the, um, the higher the star, actually the, the more complicated, uh, usually the setup for the arrangement, yep. back end expenses, you know, it's going to take a few more hours off of my research and communications manager's time. And, um, frequently it's, yeah, the turnaround is not overly shared it's um it's interesting the fame that approaches it as well the the lack of interest that they have there's it's tricky i've spoken with a, a myriad i've spoken with over 200 people just this year and um the fame you know goes from academic fame as opposed to i've spoken to some hollywood celebrities and um mm. varies as to how they're going to approach your podcast what they're going to bring to it um i've had some of my most intriguing um, podcasts that were received the most attention from, um, you know, young political ad advocates, you know, and, and people who are just like in the trench cool. and ready to go. And you really don't know who's going to bring it. But I think there is this attraction of like, oh, you're, you're speaking with who today? And it's just not that way. Because as you said, we're not on a network and there's competition as to what they want to push on their yeah. site. And, um, and have embedded. I'm curious, um, because you kind of get into, you are very clear on, and this is awesome because a lot of people say, well, I don't have a product. I'm not pushing it for that reason. And you have this product of speaking and, you know, and this, this other service that you're offering. And so, um, and I think that that would be something that people would be very unclear as to how to present. Within that, have you looked at sponsorship? Do you take sponsorship or partnerships? And what would you advise to everyone listening, look at in regards to that? And this is an area that's actually um, changing every day and kind of coming of age. I've talked to a lot of podcasters that have been really burned by taking sponsorship and things like that are not known, or it hasn't turned out to be actually the payout that they thought. And then you hit websites that say it's going to be this windfall of money. What have you done with yours and what would you advise? Okay. So, you know, I, I'm going to be completely transparent. We have not done any sponsorship or paid advertising on the show. And here's why it's because I want to get it right. Mm -hmm. uh, it can feel very attractive to start throwing up ads for Casper mattresses or Squarespace websites or whatever it may be. But you have to remember a couple things. One, my integrity is first and foremost to the audience, because if I lose the audience, we don't have a show anymore. So that's something to remember. The second thing is one of, and this is one of the things I'm thinking about, you know, friends, if you're listening to the show and thinking, Oh, I'm going to make money podcasting. Well, I, I have to, kind of uh, let you in on something, unless you have started to get 5,000 listens per episode, you're not going to make a whole lot of money doing anything. And even at 5,000, you know, that is, that's kind of the, the very beginning. So if you think, because everything is based on CPM for the most part. So what I would recommend, and one of the things that I'm looking at is how do we bring the show and how do we integrate the show into speaking or opportunities. So if there is an opportunity with a company, how can I use the show to bolster my speaker's fee? How can I use it? Maybe we show up. I mean, this is obviously pre-COVID, but let's assume we show up at one of their events and we actually do a special series just for them. You know, those are the kind of things that I'm thinking about that are different than just uh, reading an ad and, but that's also where the money is. If you really want to make a lot of money, um, you've got to think outside of the box. That does actually mean doing more work, but, um, yeah, Patricia, I'm really curious what you think about this stuff. Well, I'm divided. So at, I, be, as I began my podcasting career, I am, um, I promised myself that I would never attach any sponsorship or partnerships or ads to this particular podcast because it was my philanthropic endeavor that was supposed to be evergreen content that ended after 50 episodes. We're about 200 in right now for this particular. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'll die doing it because I love it in life itself, as is the case with most things that you endeavor into without any fiscal attachment that you just think you're, it's part of your legacy. I don't mean to sound too lofty here, but it really is a passion project of mine to um, kind of promote this um, women hearing women or female identified or non-binary voices. And so uh, 
and it just kind of took over and it's now something that really um, nourishes and feeds me. But that being said, um, so I never had any curiosity with that. I was acutely aware when I began that listenership and um, and then being able to make money and, and pitching. Since then, of course, I've had um, a, a healthy amount, I would say maybe an overly healthy amount of, of female-based companies and things like that approach us and ask if they could, um, which, you know, it's it seems like the second you say no, suddenly there's like an, an on-pour of people that... <laughs> but, <laughs> And for this one, it is good. It shares over. What I, I tell people that they need to remember is that audience ship has what's called migration in podcasting. And a, a great deal of your audience, if you, you know, if you tell them that you have another series starting, if they follow you, a lot of the time, it's not just that they're appreciating the content, but they've come to kind of know you. Um, and mm-hmm. it's all of us, but they kind of follow you over to your other platforms and things of that nature so that you can carry that over. But it's the chicken or the yep. There's been, um, so I'm old school. And when you try to build up audience ship, so before you get to advertising or sponsorship or partnership, um, and partnership's an interesting one that's kind of coming of age, you know, two people helping each other out, especially in the female business owned space, two businesses getting together. There's now new agents, there's startups right now in Silicon Valley that take two different agents and put them together. Um, to help with this partnership, like we'll plug you. Wow. And that's a very different kind of thing, but I think that has a lot of impact, particularly with disparate areas that don't think that they would, you know, a Levi's company and mm. someone, you know, selling knickknacks or whatever, coming together and kind of sharing each other's market is, um, it can be a very friendly and homogenous situation. But getting back to building up audience, I think that um, that becomes a crux. And for me, I've seen a lot of really creative and there's powerful young YouTube influencers that I just bow down to, you know? I know. They're incredible. Who can get like 20 million views in half an hour. I mean, they're just insanely creative, wonderful minds. But for the most part, I always tell people, you know, it's, it's about the investment is about like Google ads. It's about um, just your simple old school um, pay advertising, you know, and I don't mean like necessarily getting a campaign, but this drops me into a question I really wanted to ask you about, given your background, have you ever used, um, external PR or marketing groups to advertise or or start a campaign, if you will, for Brave by Design podcast, or did you yourself feel equipped? Because marketing is a huge industry. One One size does not fit all. You know, someone who can market really beautifully for an engineering or tech firm cannot do the same for a spiritual, you know, healing firm. So I'm wondering if you enlisted help from other people or did you feel really comfortable and how did you engage your beginning audience? Did you use the traditional online, you know, Google ads, that type of thing. I have never paid one dime for an ad to, to funnel to this show ever. Wow. That's impressive. And is it, I do, I, I'm listening to you, Patricia, and I'm like, oh my God, are people paying for ads? Like, I'm not doing that. No. Now here's what I have done. So because I come from that content marketing background, Mm-hmm. I can create content until I am blue in the face. And, and that's basically what I did at the beginning. And I, I actually, just as a cautionary tale, really, you know, drove myself into the ground doing that oh. and also trying to edit the show and release the show. F- folks, if you're serious about this, please don't do that because it's going to eat up a lot of your time when you need to spend that time on profit producing activities. So what I did is a couple things. The first one is I hired a podcast pitching agency. And what they would do is they would pitch me to go on shows. And they got me on, I want to say like 24 shows. And on there, you know, it's, it's kind of like this. We talk about whatever. And, you know, I would look at the call to action at the end. Where do I learn more? Go to Brave by Design, listen to the podcast. If you're already pod a podcast listener, it's very likely you want to listen to another show. So I did that at the beginning and I was consistent with my audience. You know, from, I believe it was January 7th was the first day that we launched. Could be wrong, but anyway, beginning of January until now, we are really butting up against the beginning of September. We have never missed an episode. An episode launches every single week at the same time nobody nobody can ever doubt that there's one week when we did not launch an episode and that was during blackout tuesday and that was incredibly intentional because i wanted to support black voices other than that 
we have always had an episode and you know you can you, it's predictable so that consistency that consistency in my content marketing what you see on my instagram what you see on my linkedin it's always there every week you know what to expect podcast out every week you know what to expect and i obviously have my pitch down i know what i'm talking about i know who i am i know where i'm going i know how i serve i also by the way know what i'm really lousy at so you know there's things where we hired a podcast editor best investment i've ever made in my podcast they edit the show they do all the show notes they uh, schedule it in our uh, scheduler. Um, we happen to use a service called Buzzsprout, but there's a million of them out there. And they even clip the beginning of the show uh, so that we have a little audiogram that I can share out over social during the week. So that's all automated for me. So I don't need to think about that anymore. What I can focus on is what I do well, which is talking to people, engaging people in interviews, uh, and sharing their wisdom and knowledge with our audience. Do what you do well, hire someone to do the other stuff. It is, it's the best investment you'll make. But no, I have not paid for an ad. <laughs> That's crazy. That's insane. I like that a lot. In fact, it speaks a lot too. I think your content creation and your ability to do that is an area that a lot of people can struggle with. It really depends. I don't think that there's a strength for all of it. I came from a film and photography background. So the editing was very much something that I did not want to relinquish control on. In fact, I am still after hosting four and starting my fifth one this fall, just looking at relinquishing that control because I do it so fluidly and I am still of the okay. old where it's like, are you kidding me? I'm going to bring a <laughs> silly little punk in who will do it, take twice as long, charge me an arm and a leg and won't do it as beautifully. You know, you just have those moments of ownership. Yep. Let go. But that's what you're good at. That's part of your zone of genius. So do it. You know, my zone of genius is, is in the content creation. It is definitely not in sitting in, sitting in front of pro tools or whatever it is, editing a podcast, but like, that's beautiful. Garage band. Well, and, but I think that there's a moment to also like if I was going to increase my happiness and um, I think it's my um, expertise, but if I'm really climbing into my zone of genius, if I feel like I was put on this earth to do something, it's this, you know, and if I want to do more of this and continue doing more podcasts, I need to kind of let go of that end of it. Um, I think it's like making your own bed. I, but again, I feel weird having someone do it for me. It just feels wrong. You know, <laughs> in this world where I'm like, but if you can do it so well, why don't you do, you know, but um, mm -hmm. it, where you have to start switching into thinking like more of like a Titan, you know, someone yep. who, like you're letting other people do that for a reason. as a different percent. Um, I'm curious about how you sculpt and curate your show. This is something that um, it varies so drastically and it's never been the same for any podcast host I've spoken to. But when you go to kind of sculpt your show, did it come from this Brave by Design came from this, you know, this impetus and ethos from the inception. And has it always stayed that way? Or does it kind of change per your career trajectory? Is it laid out? Are you more business oriented? Is it the next three months we're going to focus on this area? Because I think that really pertains to what's happening with the pandemic. Like how much curation process goes into it and what guides that? Boy, that is, that's a big question. Um, let me, let me do my best to answer it. When we started the show, I just wanted to bring on people that were inspiring, people that were empowering, and people who had a message. Going back to what we, let's kick back to what we said at the very beginning of the show. I'm very clear on what I do. And anyone who's listening to this who wants to get on a podcast, if you talk like you're go, talking out of both sides of your mouth, like you're going in 400 directions and we don't know what thread to pull on, that becomes very difficult for a podcast host to make a compelling episode out of because you're all over the place. So being clear on, does this person have a clear message? Maybe they have a book, maybe they have a website where I understand exactly what they do and how they serve. That was very important. My message was very important to women, but it was also important to men who identify as advocates or allies because we cannot pull ourselves along alone we need people in power to help lift us up because they're already there and it is part of their duty to help us. So I needed to make sure that some of the episodes are accessible to people who aren't like me. During coronavirus, we did a big shift because I was completely, I mean, I, I'm a speaker. Can you imagine what happened to my business? It completely dissolved. It was like a nightmare. So I, uh, 
did a big shift in the show. We were doing two episodes a week, sometimes three episodes a week. I was bringing on people to talk about all areas of life pertaining to COVID, stress management, finances, all kinds of stuff. Um, now that this experience has more been integrated into our collective journey, we are doing our two episodes a week, one on mindset, one with our guests. Um, and what, I, what has shifted a little over time, and I'll tell you this, is that at the beginning, I really just wanted to bring on business people. And what I realized in doing that is I was sort of feeding into this notion that when you go to work, you have to put your business face on. And I said, you know, Laura, that's not totally authentic because there are people who are listening who are having challenges in all areas of life. And so once in a while, I wanna make sure we have an episode to cover those other areas of life. So for example, we went way out of the wheelhouse and we did an episode with um, a very famous astrologer. Now that is completely outside of what I would normally do, but it's, it is actually our most popular episode. And that was, can you believe that? Um, that was during the pandemic. I said, we don't know what the hell's going on. Can you, you want to look at the stars and tell us? And she was awesome. We did another episode uh, with a woman who believes in a lot in helping, um, helping women close the orgasm gap. Now, that is really different from what I normally talk about. Again, one of our most popular episodes, because I think women are hungry, especially business women are hungry for that type of content. You can't divorce who you are as a woman, who you are as a human being, who you are as a mom, a husband, a wife, whatever it may be, from who you are when you go into work. And so that has shifted a little bit. I will tell you how I got a lot of the big names that we got on the show. Um, is I just, I just linked in with them. <laughs> I just contacted people right. and I said, Hey, I love what you're doing. You want to come on? You know, 75% said yes. 25% ignored me. All right, whatever, you know, moving on. And, uh, some of those people I'm proud to say a couple of them I'm, I'm friendly with, I email with, I care about, they share my stuff. I share their stuff. Hey, that's awesome. But others of those people just help validate the show. So, you know, help sort of bring some sort of uh, oomph to the show, so to speak. Yeah, I think shows that get too microscopic can actually have fallout. I don't have any proof of that, but I have spoken to some really um, sage. I've only been in the game for three years and I've spoken to people who've been podcasting for like eight. And oh. um, I know I'm like, you're a dinosaur. That's so awesome. But, um, or <laughs> flagship, I should say, not a dinosaur, but um they uh, they talk a lot about um, how you know it's uh, like rebooting is like wildly necessary because you think you've got this faithful audience, but eventually there's some new shiny thing that comes along that's kind of doing what you're doing. But they're tying in things like astrologists occasionally, right. and it just it spices things up. And it's also like if you don't continue to evolve, you die. You know, it's Darwinism. It's podcast Darwin. Totally. And so, and I love this. Um, you know, you kind of started out with this idea of saying, I thought it, you weren't going to have a curation process, but you clearly do. You had a very microscopic one that you started to inject mm -hmm. these fuses of. And yeah, I will say um, some of across all four of my podcasts, the most wildly listened to ones are ones that I was like, oh, this is kind of dicey. And this is my whole umbrella for this particular one is if you're a woman, female identified or non-binary and you have a professional chronicle, I want to hear it, you know, and That's so cool. They, like, I brought someone on who was, um, we've had some really interesting healers and spiritual, and the, the names they used to describe themselves with, I had to, like, really research. I couldn't identify it. I don't know anything about the, what they call the woo community. Mm. And, um, those were some of the most, like, we had, at, I've, our, our audience is usually professionals, young and old, and um, I was amazed at how many people, it was uh, shared, tweeted, did. And I think it's that kind of an idea that, you know, people are kind of expecting this thing and then you bring someone on. And especially if I always tell people, 
when you bring someone of that nature on, try to keep your format the same. Don't become all into their environment, you know, which is why I, I always suggest have a roadmap, like have, have structure that you try to ask yeah. every single person because you're still bringing in the same core tenets of, of what you do. And it actually brings it out of them. It was really cool to ask her about her business model. People were just like, yeah, mind, you know, she like reads people's futures. And you were like, so what's your business model? like?" <laughs> Now, I love that. I mean, that's incredible. We do have a format. My format, though, is very conversational, but I start most of my episodes by trying to suss out their story because I like a good story. And if I can't get the story out, I'm just like, what, what's happening here? Like where <laughs> I feel very like unmoored if they don't have a great story to share. So I love to start out that way. But that's so cool. Can I say one more thing, Patricia? Can I say... Nobody needs another boring podcast. I, I'm serious. Like I, <laughs> as a business professional, I, and I'm not going to call out names, but there are very well-established podcasts in my area that I feel like I am going to lapse into a coma after two minutes. I cannot handle it. And so for me, one of the things I said is we ain't going to be boring. So, you know, <laughs> that, that's, that's one of my, my things I really stand by. And I also like to encourage people. There are so many podcasts now, and I don't think that has to be a bad thing. There are some really famous podcasts for politics and things like that. that get cited a lot that I just think there are better ones out there. And I don't even mind saying it because I know one of them actually personally, but Pod Save America, those cats are cool. And they did an amazing job during the Obama yep. administration, but there's a ton of episodes that I know for a fact, they would be like, ah, eh, we could have done better. Like there's actual political podcasts out there that are grassroots that they are like really fighting for and they're fascinating and they do just as an informative job so just be mindful of that like following the most trended one is not necessarily the best and since there are so many you know you can find people such as yourself that are going to take you along for the ride and not bore you to tears if you're bored during a podcast you need to click off <laughs> not happen you know? just don't don't listen I know there's no obligation there. You didn't sign a contract, but you know, business podcasts, especially like they try to be so buttoned up. And that's the, that's the thing that I've all, I mean, throughout my career, I have rebelled against that because it's not authentic. It's, it's the epitome of phoniness. And I, I don't know why I have a real trigger around that, but apparently I do. And so I was like, we are not going to be phony. We are going to call people on their stuff. We are going to make sure we understand what, what they're saying. Because I want to ask the questions that the listener would like to know of, but is too afraid to ask themselves. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's where it gets really interesting. Mm -hmm. And you want, to, you want that audience to feel like you're answering their call. You know, that's the yeah. whole, like, this is why you're listening. This is why I'm speaking. A thousand percent. I agree. And to that end, I want to know if you make one to three year goals, your podcast is new yet. Um, however, have you looked at the trajectory? We've talked about the curation process. There tends to be some change involved in that. Have you looked at what you're going to do over the next year with it? Do you see any change? You have this format, you have the release, all of these logistics like really buttoned up. And it sounds like those are working for you. What do you see for the next year out? Well, I, I'll say this. The first thing is we have our show booked pretty much, I want to say four months ahead now. We are very ahead of the game. So we do know what's coming up four to six months down the road. I'm going to, I'm going to answer this question this way. I'm going to say I had this dream and you guys are going to laugh and I don't care if you laugh. That's fine. I had this dream years ago and I said, I'm going to be the next Howard Stern of business. Now, no, you know, Howard Stern, he's great in his area and he's a great interviewer. Um, but I always had this vision of that's who I want to become. I want to be that for women in a way that's integral, in a way that feels good, in a way that's no holds barred. And in a way that's not like overtly and purely sexual and over-sexualized because we are, I, I just feel like we already have a lot of that. Um, I want to do it in a different way. So that's always in my head is I want to be the Howard Stern of business for women. And so as I build the podcast, that's still there. I want to be a great interviewer. I want to have people engage with the podcast hit 112 in iTunes or sorry, 
112 and Apple Podcast career section two months after we launched. So I saw that and I was like, holy mackerel, that's awesome. Now, just for anyone listening who's thinking, oh, wow, we must be a big deal. Those numbers fluctuate up and down all the time. So, you know, we're 112 one day, we're, you know, 4,000 the next day. But that really showed me, oh, people are listening. People are paying attention. They want this. And so uh, I continue to drive towards that really big goal. So that can mean, um, you know, building out the podcasting. That can mean getting into a professional studio. That can mean getting, you know, I see Brave by Design ultimately post-COVID or whenever we're more safe as we do tours around the country and we go meet these women, just like some of the other podcasts do, where they go meet their audience. But I wanna do it in a format where people you know, feel really welcomed and loved and supported. So those are the, some of the things we're thinking of long-term. But yeah, in the meantime, it's really about building my, uh, building knowledge of who I am so that I can gain more speaking engagement so that I can then offer more to the Brave by Design community uh, to better serve them. Yeah, that sounds clear. It sounds very clear. <laughs> it does. I can see, I can follow that train of thought. Normally I'm like, how is anyone getting there? That that actually does sound clear. I want to grab one thing that you said um, for people listening. I get this, I ask this a lot and um, I think it changes per podcaster, but you talked about being booked four to six months out right now. This is something scheduling and things like that, that has a lot of differencing of opinions because your guest format or the testimony, whatever rhetoric you're capturing becomes um, stale, which is okay if it's evergreen content. But how do you deal with the issue of having collected data four to six months before it's released or a month before it's released? Or how back far is your release? Okay. You say four to six, so, are you talking about bookings or are you talking about- We're booked. We're booked. We're booked about four months in advance. However, the episodes are recorded between four to six weeks before they'll go out. Yeah. So typically we're tracking towards someone's book release. We're tracking towards something else going on or it's evergreen content. Um, the way that we edit the show, however, is the episodes are edited two weeks in advance of release. Mm -hmm. So that means if anything happens uh, in between when we record and when it's going out, I have a pretty near, a pretty sort of short time there where I can record an update. I can share something with the audience and the pre-roll to the episode that helps keep it updated and fresh. So we have a very clear schedule of how we move forward. I see a lot of podcasters fall on their face because they don't know who they're talking to or they're going week to week. And I say, you know what, get ahead of it. That way, if something comes up, Patricia, let's say, Let's say something comes up, God forbid, another COVID type situation. But if something comes up that's really dramatic and major, I have enough flexibility in the schedule that I can pop someone in, in between, or even a couple people in, and it's not throwing everything off. Yeah, absolutely. And that's funny because everyone that I've spoken to who's been um, in it long enough to have a really solidified engine, the numbers are exactly the same. Um, and wow. Included. Yeah, it's about two weeks out for editing the final edit um, because, you know, there is change. There are changes that come up. I actually haven't ever had one, but I knew just from my recording career prior to that. It's just it's it's um, a little bit of suicide to do anything longer than two weeks out for anything that's supposed to go live with a previous edit. And also, uh, you know, um, filling up the calendar, but not recording it, at least for me. I know a lot of people record two months out and release. Um, I think that's a little dicey only because my audience, there's a lot of um, zeitgeist that gets dropped in these podcasts that we don't hear about. And I think even people can feel a little short change. Like, what was this B-roll? Like, when did they record this? Why is she talking about summer? And it's, it's December. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You got to watch out for that. Recording them on vodcast or like for YouTube and things like that, you know, once you're dressed in sweaters, it just, it starts to feel dated. And for me, if you're pitching something that is there, it should be within the past, you know, four weeks. It doesn't have to be breaking news, but, and like you say, you know, there are a lot of people who come on podcasts because they're doing their tours, they're doing their circuits, they're trying to push that media for one reason or another. And you want to at very least give your audience like that fresh feel, I would think, you know? So, um, yeah. 
There is that. But yeah, that's, it's funny because it comes out in the wash, the four to six weeks out, the two weeks out for editing, all of those things to be able to um, change anything. Yeah, it tends to be the same. It's funny. I'm waiting for that person that's like, I do it the night before. Like someone who's just like completely... <laughs> Um, I, it gives me like uh, anxiety to think about things that way, but um, I, I was going to say, I don't think I, you yeah. know, when I was editing the show myself, that's what it was like. I mean, it, it was complete chaos because I'm running a business and then I'm editing the show at the same time at 3 a.m. And I thought this is something's not sustainable here. So uh, yeah, don't, don't do that guys. It's a recipe for, for burnout, at least in my opinion. I agree. And I like the tidbits that you dropped about, you know, Buzzsprout and like different things where you're, you've, you've contracted out like very graceful. Yeah. And I think a lot of people get into, in New York City, they have a place that uh, it's called Gotham something or other, but prior to COVID, you could simply just walk in. It was a recording. They would record, edit, like all of it. And I'm sure it was kind of pricey, but it is this idea that, you know, if you have funds or if you have this idea, like there's a lot of different ways you can go about podcasting from doing it all yourself to having someone completely different do it. Um, we are almost out of time, Laura, which kind of bums, really bums me out actually, but I want to asking you um, my favorite question and I wrap this every podcast in this series up with it, but if you were approached tomorrow in a garden or an outdoor space at safe social distance by a young woman or a female identified or non-binary individual who came up to you, uh, pretty much anyone other than like a, a white man in this. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> glad I found you. We have a friend in common. Um, she recommended that I find and come talk to you. I've had this massive career in, um, in marketing and um, where I wasn't really appreciated for my voice. Then I came into my own. I had this wildly successful, you know, um, content marketing career. And then I've launched this branded kind of development empire on my own. I'm just getting ready to launch this podcast and this whole thing um, next week. What are the top three pieces of advice you would give that individual knowing what you know now? I would say to think about what makes your heart sing and in within that vein, what is the challenge that breaks your heart that you want to solve? Because as I, you know, I've, I've, I've spoken several times in this episode about making money, but ultimately the challenge you want to solve, the thing that breaks your heart is in service to helping your community and you deserve to be handsomely paid for it. So that is the first thing. What makes your heart sing? And in within that, the other side, what is actually breaking your heart that you would love to help solve? The next thing is how can you outsource or delegate the items that do not make your heart sing to somebody who loves those things? Because the key to being a leader is understanding you cannot, nor should you be doing it all on your own. That is ridiculous. Mm. The third piece of advice is to find someone who has done what you want to do and sit in a room with them and learn from them. It is so, if, it is, if that is someone who's ahead of a company, if that is someone who is a coach, if you know, whoever it is who you can learn from, whether you have to read their books, whether you have to pay for a coaching session, whether you have to just email them out of the blue and say, hey, please help me. Please go learn from people who have done what you want to do, learn from their mistakes, learn from their wins so that you can be wiser in how you grow. I love it. Yeah, I mean, those are so prolific. This is your, this is your forte. This is why you get paid the big bucks to speak <laughs> advice. I love it. I'm going to do a horrible thing and, and sum it up now. And that's very rare that I hate summing people up, but now I'm like, I'd rather not restate this. Um, so I've got number one, think about what makes your heart sing. And conversely, um, the challenge that breaks your heart and um, that you want to solve and let your kind of motivation come from there and your crystallization of your ideas and motivation. Number two, how can you outsource and delegate the things that don't make your heart sing to someone who does enjoy those things and um, move more fluidly through your endeavors? Number three, how can you find someone who you can learn from um, that will help you be wiser as you grow? 
And that's so cool. I think you can find people that you can learn from that don't make you wiser. They can make you more insecure. That last little bit on the end is, is crucial, I think, in finding a mentor or a teacher, an aide, a coach. Of anyone, absolutely, Patricia. If anyone who's above you, you know, in, in their endeavor or where they are in their experience tells you, you can't do this, please put the phone down and make another phone call because that is bananas. Um, I, I think that a lot of these things can come from a place of insecurity or scarcity mindset as opposed to abundance. There is enough, as Patricia and I know, there is enough to go around. We can have a million more podcasters out there and it is A-okay with me because if you have a voice, we want to hear from you, right? So there's no scarcity around this stuff. But yes, yeah, some, some people in leadership roles do not want they want to hold on to their thing. They don't want to give. And if, if you encounter someone like that, just keep it moving. Agreed. And for good reason. You know, both of us being um, people who identify as women, I, it's usually the, the, the communities and the populations that have been um, relegated to the outskirts and discriminated against for hundreds of years are, you know, the most um, contentious in a lot of areas because they've had to fight for the seat at the table. Melinda Gates has a lot to say about this with women supporting women. And so mm. I, I try not to ascribe uh, blame or anything else, but I think you're right. Keep it moving. Find someone who isn't, because there's tons, there's tons of them out there that will do it. Yeah. So many people to help. Hey, thanks for having me on. This was so fun. Laura, I appreciate it. Um, and for everyone listening, I want to tell you once again, we've been speaking with Laura Khalil. She's a speaker, teacher, podcaster, and host of um, the podcast Brave by Design. You can find out more about everything that she's done and everything we've talked about today, as well as listen to her podcast on www.bravebydesign.net. Thank you so much for giving us your time today. For those of you listening, I do appreciate all of you. And this is me reminding you to stay in love with one another, stay safe, and always bet on yourself. Sláinte.